be seated. Hi, friend. Hi. Okay. <laughs> so listen, I want you all to know that, um, that the story that January is going to tell you, she has never told publicly before. It's true. It's very true. Let's pull this a little closer, okay? Okay. Okay. Yeah? All right. So hold January in the light of God's love and let us all join our hearts together in prayer. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Last spring, I went, as I always do, to the Festival of Homiletics. That's big churchy language for preaching convention. And my college friend, January Simpson, decided to go with me. Which is odd, because I'm not clergy. And at the time, I had been intentionally not going to church for like 25 years. <laughs> but I do like God, and I like listening to smart people talk about God. So I thought, why not go and listen to smart people talk about God? And also, the real motivation, road trip with Leah. <laughs> yeah. So we get there and we find all of my clergy friends who I know from the 2030 Clergy Network, Timoth, who pastors in Rhode Island, and Chris Davies, who's on the national staff of the United Church of Christ and is the originator of the queer clergy training cards, some of you know about those, and Rachel and Sarah. And January and I, we dive in, we sing and we listen and we worship. We find my seat buddy from all of the previous festivals that I've been to because church people like their pew, whether it's in their own church or this once a year preaching convention that they go to. That's right. And this was fun for me because actually I loved going to church when I was little. I'm a preacher's kid, a PK, sort of. And I went to graduate school for philosophy, so these sorts of discussions are enjoyable for me. Enjoyable for me. Don't let January fool you. Jay is a Heidegger scholar. <clears throat> Before the causa sui. English, please, for our non-Latin speakers right, in the room. Right, right. Causa sui meaning the cause of itself, which Heidegger says is the right name for the god of philosophy. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So. Before the Casa Sui, man can neither fall to his knees in awe, nor can he play music and dance before this god. See? Heidegger Scholar. Mm -hmm. And Jay, when you say, I'm sort of a PK, I'm sort of a pastor's kid, what does that mean? Well, what it means is that my dad was a Presbyterian minister. He served a church in Leesburg, Virginia, up until a little before I was born, and then he didn't serve a church again until I was in the fourth grade, and at that one, he only served as an interim for about half a year. Well, that's odd. Yeah, yeah. Um, the reason he left the church in Leesburg is that he chose to be with his soon-to-be new baby, that's me, and with my mom. Uh, and my mom happened to be the church secretary, and both of them were already married to other people when they fell in love. And my mom left and divorced her husband, but my dad could not and would not divorce his wife because of his own theological convictions about divorce, which sounds odd in the context, and wanting to keep his covenant with her, she was dependent on him for health insurance. She had rheumatoid arthritis, which at the time meant she wasn't employable or insurable. Um, his deacons at the time confronted him and said that he could leave my mom or he could leave the church. And he gave his last sermon that Sunday. I have this clear memory of January's dad of being in their living room when I was a senior in college. I had already discerned a call to ministry, and I remember sitting at her daddy's feet and listening to him tell the most amazing stories. I wanted to soak up everything that I could because I knew that life was messy and being a pastor was a hard job. 
And I remember thinking that this man was like Joseph, that he was this righteous man who wanted to do right by everyone, even if the powers that be at the time disagreed. So, so even though he wasn't serving in churches, did you go to church growing up? Uh, we did. I even started the confirmation process. I had to study in the little book thing. The, the Presbyterian Book of Order? Is that what it's called? Sure, right? Again, not a traditional PK. <laughs> we could always ask Connie, our That's resident right. Presbyterian. <laughs> Um, but you did go to church. Yeah, we went to church pretty regularly, and I started the confirmation process, and during my studying for that, I started learning about predestination. And I remember saying to my dad in the car that I didn't think I could be a Presbyterian because predestination didn't make sense to me. It just didn't sound right. And how old were you? Um, I don't know, 11-ish? C. Heidegger scholar. <laughs> uh, anyway, he was really proud of me for taking it seriously, um, and he wanted me to keep thinking about it. So you kept thinking about it, yeah. and you thought about it, and then? And then we stopped going to church. As people often do when we value certainty over mystery. And when you grow up queer in West Virginia. Well, yes, there is that too. Yes, when you grow up queer in West Virginia, church is not an option. And so I decided that I didn't need church to have faith or live faithfully or whatever. But I've always known that I believe in God, although what that means has changed for me. And in addition to all the reasons that I might not have for trusting the church. And there are lots of reasons to not trust a church. I've always known that there's a real risk of putting church before God or of making church equal to God. And when that happens, people get hurt, like my dad. But I also remembered really liking church and feeling jealous of people who felt really certain of the good things that happen at church. I mean, let's be clear, right? Churches don't always get it right because churches are made up of human beings, messy human beings. But maybe there's a clue to this Christianity thing in our humanness, in the mess. It's impossible to practice Christianity fully outside of a community of humans who are trying to practice this faith. Jesus came to be with us. So maybe we ought to be with each other, too. But I wasn't going to go where I wasn't wanted. And you were told, since you were in utero, that you were not wanted by the church. For more reasons than one. For more reasons than one. But then Leah called and said, hey, do you want to go to this preaching convention with me? It's like church camp for grown-ups. And so I said, hell yeah, I'll go. And while we were there one night, Chris Davies decided that we all needed to go out. To Sister Louisa's Church of the Living Room and Ping Pong Emporium. Now, <laughs> Sister Louisa's Church of the Living Room and Ping Pong Emporium may sound like a church, mm. but it's not a church. It's a bar. A really kitschy bar. It's a, it's a kitschy church-themed bar with lots of kitschy Christian-themed knickknackery that's funny and it's subversive and it's probably not everybody's cup of tea. Just know that if you go to Atlanta. But you throw a bunch of my friends into this place and we're taking selfies all over the place. And we've got our drinks and we go upstairs and we settle into a table in the middle of the upper room. The upper room. The upper room. The upper room. <laughs> uh, and there we drank and we talked and we visited, you know, like you do in a bar. And somehow the subject of baptism came up. I don't know why. Uh, is that small talk for preachers? It totally is small talk for preachers. <laughs> cool, cool. And so I told the story of our church, of us being on that mission trip to Jamaica when we're standing knee deep in the Caribbean and suddenly Jessica Smiley and Izzy Colazzo and one of our Souls for Souls leaders are baptized there at Aquasol, <laughs> home of Sexy Rave, which is a beach bar, by the way. Uh, and somehow it comes up in that conversation that, oh, hey, I've not been baptized. And Chris Davies and I lit up. We said, well, you know, we could do that. 
we could do that right here. You know, we could baptize you. We could baptize you right here in this bar. We could baptize you at Sister Louisa's Church of the Living Room and Ping Pong Emporium. It would be so cool. <laughs> Y'all were pretty excited. But then we backed off mm -hmm. immediately because baptism via peer pressure is never the way to go. <laughs> so I said that I didn't think I wanted to join a church. And at least back when I was going to church, those two things were pretty well linked. But everyone said, no, no, baptism doesn't have anything to do with joining a church. Because if that's all it's good for, it severely limits the grace of God. But it was just inconceivable to me that this sacrament could happen on its own. So in explaining why I thought that baptism had to be linked with joining a church, I explained my whole non-church going backstory and all of its history to these churchy types to this table full of pastors, which I just told you a few minutes ago. And we all listened. And we all said... <laughs> I think you all said, so what? So what if you're a bastard child of a disgraced Presbyterian minister and his church secretary? They said that, but like in a more friendly way. <laughs> because baptism is an outward and visible sign of an inward and invisible grace. And grace is God's unmerited favor. It's God loving us just because. We didn't earn it. We don't rack up good people points. Grace just is. And there's absolutely no reason why someone should ever be denied baptism for any reason, period. For that matter, there's no reason why that sacrament should be sequestered to the institution itself as a tool for its own use. If it is, then this grace that we offer on God's behalf isn't worth the water bill that we pay for it. That's a much friendlier way. And the conversation moved on, and I sort of just sat there processing what had happened, mulling it over. And then I was thirsty. I wanted a glass of water. And there was this water cooler that sat in the back corner of the upper room. So I got up, and I went back to the water cooler. And I take my little plastic cup, and I'm filling up my plastic cup. And there's this sticker on the water cooler. I think to myself, Fontis. <laughs> that says Fontis. Oh my God, that says Fontis, as in I am a font. Font is, this is a font, as in come, O oh font of every blessing. Oh my God. And so I go back to our table and I whisper in January's ear, January, I am just telling you that if you do want to get baptized, the water fountain is a font. It has a sticker on it. It says Fontis. I am a font. And I thought, oh man, she's really serious about this. And then I laughed a lot. But then a little later, Leah leaned over and whispered, January, you don't have to get baptized if you don't want to. Because as we have established, Baptism via peer pressure is never the way to go. And I'm just easily excitable all the time, and January Fact. knows that. <laughs> it's true. But as I was sitting there thinking, it had never been the case that I didn't want to be baptized. I just didn't think I'd be a good Presbyterian, and I wanted to be included in the family of God. It was also the case that for a few years now, I had been recognizing that my faith in God had become more of a logic problem about God and that maybe from being in school for philosophy too long or not going to church for so long, my belief in God had become more of a thought experiment for me than an actual lived experience. And that was unsettling. Because as Heidegger says, <laughs> before the kausasui, which means the cause of itself, man can neither fall to his knees in awe, nor can he play music and dance before this God. And that was my problem. I had come to conceive of God in philosophical terms as the causa sui and lots of other things that you can conceive of God as in philosophy, and to only think about God. I couldn't worship God. So I sat there and thought that maybe, maybe it wouldn't be a bad thing to be baptized, and that it would probably do me some good. 
So I turned to Leah and I said, hey, okay. Really? Yeah, sure. I'd like to be baptized, please. January is always so polite. <laughs> <laughs> you have not ever seen five more happy pastors in a bar than Chris, Timoth, Rachel, Sarah, and myself, who are going to baptize somebody in this upper room. So we arranged the space. Chris sat on January's right, and I sat on January's left, and the rest of the folks sat across the table from us. In a pew. It's a kitschy church-themed bar. And so they all got out their cameras as if I were a little baby, and they were my proud family. And I drew some water out of the font. Font is, it is a font. The sign said so. <laughs> and then Chris did some welcome and a little theological reflection. And then I turned to the people who were gathered, and I did my favorite part of the sacrament, the part I can never get through without crying, the congregational assent. I reminded Sarah, Rachel, Chris, and Timoth that they are placeholders. They're part of this communion of saints, and they answer on behalf of the people who have come before us and all the people who will come after us. We wish that we could promise you a world without fear, January, a world without pain, a world without suffering. Well, we can't make that promise. But we do promise that God will love you, God will love you, no matter what life brings. And that we as a community will stand as the people of God with you in whatever you face. And if you can make that promise, I said, then say yes, we promised this, and they did. And I turned to January and I said, by what name shall we call you? January Lynn Simpson. Do you desire to be baptized? And I remember this moment, and I looked at Leah, and I said, I really do. She really does. <laughs> and then she baptized me out of a plastic cup of water from a font, from a font. Then we held hands and prayed. And I don't pray in public. And listen, I don't actually play, pray in public either, unless it's my job to mm -hmm. publicly pray. <laughs> but there we were holding hands and praying in public. And we were in a room full of people. They were playing ping pong right behind Timoth, Sarah, and Rachel. We were not in some empty upper room above Sister Louise's um, church of the sofa and ping pong emporium. We were in a elbow to elbow packed bar. And we were all crying. I mean, I didn't cry that night. Uh, I may have cried the rest of the week at the festival, though, because I was just so happy and so grateful. And I was happy to finally be worshiping God. I, I worshiped. I didn't just think. And every single sermon and lecture at the festival for the rest of the week was eerily connected to things we had been talking about that night and every night after as if the Holy Spirit was actually at work, <laughs> binding all things together. And I felt claimed by God for the very first time. And the skies opened up, and the Holy Spirit descended as a dove. And a voice from the heavens said, You are my child, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. And you have been my child as was your dad, and as is your mom. And this water, it is an outward and visible sign of an inward and invisible grace that reminds us that I have claimed you from the very start, and I have loved you, says God, with an unconditional love all along. Amen. Amen.
as we come to our time of prayer, I would direct your attention to the requests that are on the yellow sheet in your bulletin. And then today, I, we were handed two cards. The Mannons would like prayers of joy because their granddaughter, Nicole, has landed safely in Grenada for a semester of learning and relationship building. And Harvey Welch wants to thank everyone for their prayers after his accident. And he says that he appreciates them very much and he's fine, he's fine. Please join me in prayer. God of love and light, you